Okay, if you've been in the audiobook publishing business or you're thinking about going into the audiobook publishing business, you're probably thinking to yourself, like, hey, where do I get a good narrator? Well, it just so happens I found quite a few good narrators. In fact, one of them seemed near perfect. In fact, so much so, she was actually detected for being text-to-speech. That's right. They thought she was artificial intelligence. I'm going to be talking about that in today's episode with our guest interview and Ida Maria Boysen. So make sure you stay tuned to today's video. Hey there, it's Dale here with Self Publishing with Dale. And if you want to learn more about publishing books itself, make sure, of course, you hit that subscribe button, ring the bell notification icon so you don't miss a single one of these videos and interviews that are very unique, just like this one, where I'm going to be speaking to an experienced narrator. In fact, uh, just a little bit of information about Ida. She and I were actually just speaking just before we got on here. She's actually a professional audiobook narrator, of course, has produced close to 200 audiobooks in the past few years spanning multiple genres. She's recorded best-selling audiobooks in romance, thrillers, nonfiction, young adults, business, spirituality, self-development, health and fitness, and kids' genres. Ida prides herself on her engaging narration style and on her professionalism when working with authors to help make the audiobook production process as easy for them as possible. And I'm going to say that as a testimonial here that all of that is true. She is really super easy to work with and her professionalism is second to none. And rather than bloviating anymore, I think it's important that we bring Ida Maria Boyce into the show. Ida, how you feeling? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm alive and kicking. Uh, big apologies to the folks that actually had come here an hour early. <laughs> it said 10.15 on YouTube. It meant to say 11.15. But those of you watching the replay, thank you very much for tuning in. I do want to say to you, if you're watching right now, you got questions, please load them up inside the comments or inside the live chat. And I'll be sure to address those because I'm going to be selfishly asking Ida some questions. And you better stay till the end because we're going to tell you the crazy story the two of us went through. And I'm telling you, I, I, it nearly gave me a heart attack. But, you know, I think it's important that we do lay a little bit of groundwork first, Ida. And um, I want to ask you, what brought you into the business of audiobook narration? So I actually kind of fell into it. Um, where I was working, I had a corporate job. And uh, at one point... Uh, because I was in the department that also had a creative department, they asked me to do a voiceover because of my Canadian accent. So I was living in a country that was not English speaking. Um, and it was actually really fun to do. Uh, they coached me and everything. And ironically, the character that I voiced was uh, an AI. <laughs> so that was my <laughs> first voiceover. And from there, um, because I really enjoyed it. And I remember when they played it for the whole department, um, the vice president turned to me and said, oh, you could do this for a living. And I thought, oh, side hustle. Um, so I started doing the max and I did really short voiceovers and then at one point somebody approached me to do an audiobook and I really liked it. I really like working with uh, longer projects and getting into a book and I love reading and that's how I kind of fell into it. And I eventually discovered ACX and then mm -hmm. I've been working on there ever since. Do you go on any that's other platforms besides ACX? Um, for other voiceover stuff, I've tried Upwork and Fiverr, um, mm -hmm. but I find that I prefer to work mostly on ACX because I prefer just to be direct with the authors and mm -hmm. with uh, Upwork and Fiverr, they have all these rules and then the extra fees. I feel that it's, I think I feel it's just better to work directly with the authors. And I also feel a bit um, better working directly on their platform uh, because if you have any issues, it's much better to reach out directly to ACX. And I think it's also easier for our authors as well when they hire directly through ACX because then, you know, we upload the files. If there's any issues, technical issues, um, we take care of it directly. And there's also a bit of, um, you know, a bit of a safety net because you don't want to have your account banned or something like that. So I feel that people tend to behave a bit better directly on the platform. Yeah, so I, it never occurred to me, and uh, sorry to delve a little bit off of our beaten path here, that ACX doesn't charge the narrator anything, do they? No. Wow, wow. So that gives you really good reason to stay on ACX because you do have a little bit of shelter there and you get to keep all of your earnings then. Yes, yeah. So I'm going to say this, that you're, you're, right now your voice is, is awesome. 
But when you actually go on to audiobook narration, you, your pacing is on point. Like you're, you're really good. It's almost like you have a metronome set up. And I'm sure we'll probably go into why you probably have such perfect pacing here in just a second. And your delivery is impeccable. Everything you pronounce, you pronounce it exactly the same every single time. You don't hear any breaths. Everything's just, how did you learn how to narrate audiobooks that stinking good? So a lot of it was self-taught. I did get coaching at one point, but um, as the joke that you made about the metronome, that'll come into play. I'm a classically trained violinist. So my entire life, I've been very aware of how things sound and listening back to my playing violin and analyzing it. So I did the same thing with my narration. I would listen back and think, okay, especially with the breaths, you have to fix the problem as you're narrating for the most part, instead of just trying to attempt to edit everything out. Um, so that's how a lot of it came about. And also having a musical ear, I think also helps um, because I do pay attention to my tone and the pacing and trying to make sure that um, I'm keeping the listener engaged in what I'm reading. I'm making it interesting. And also the type of tone and all those types of things, um, I feel they have to match the book. So I, I just take that into consideration, I guess, because of all of my musical backgrounds, it just, um, it, comes naturally to me, I guess. It just seems logical to pay attention to those things because it is a also an auditive art form, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Do you <laughs> so think, think that gives you really important? Do you think that gives you an advantage over other audiobook narrators? I think that uh, it did make it easier for me to go from complete beginner to, you know, being able to deliver um, a professional quality audiobook. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> because I was just more, more aware of. Um, what I should be paying attention to. I listen to it with the same type of attention I would listen to my performances. Wow, how many years did you do classical music? Um, I did it for about 20 years before I decided to switch to um, a desk job. <laughs> yeah, so for the majority of that time, I was a professional violinist and earned my living in music. So I've basically grown up in the arts. <laughs> Wow. It's been a big part of my life. Yeah, it's 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 Always. kinda natural. You're right over here being a voiceover talent. So what were some of the challenges starting out as an audiobook narrator? Uh, just not really knowing very much about it, uh, especially because I was not living in Canada or America where you do have um the unions and all those types of things. Um I just felt very detached from the community. And in the beginning, I just had no idea. So I just tried to go online and read a lot of uh, articles, watch videos and things like that. And uh, it did take a while before I started to, you know, find Facebook groups and things like that, where I learned quite a lot about it. And especially about the business side, because I felt like in the beginning, apart from ACX, I didn't really understand how do you find authors? How do you approach them? How do you build those relationships? Yeah. So being on a different continent doesn't really help. <laughs> if you want to narrate for the American and Canadian markets. I don't even remember now. It's, uh, how did I stumble over you? Did you end up doing an audition for me or did I find you? I believe I auditioned for, for your book. Interesting. Yeah, because really it, 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 it was funny because, uh, yeah, I'll have to go back and look at all the auditions for that particular book. I've used it as an example in my publishing course as well as here on the channel. And uh, I... I remember there was a ton of auditions and I was like, done. I was like, this one right here. <laughs> Cause there's sometimes you'll find some narrators that will, it sounds like they're on their, their cell phone. Like what, what's going on with these folks? Uh, so uh, I got a question. Uh, yeah. You're kind of like, I think I can answer that. It's all those um, quick side hustle videos where people mm. that um, I don't think know quite enough about what it takes to be a professional narrator tell people you can just get a pair of headphones and just you know read it and that's it you're done <laughs> what and that that's, doesn't that's work <laughs> oh my gosh yeah no. <laughs> so uh what are some of the biggest misconceptions about narrators do you think uh i think the the biggest one that i run into is when you tell people you're a narrator people say oh i love reading to my children i do your that too <laughs> And you think, okay, there, there's a lot more that goes into it, though. And also the reality of actually sitting down and narrating. I think people don't realize that, um, for the most part, we we sit in very small, enclosed, dark spaces with um, not a lot of ventilation because the microphone would pick up the AC or a fan. So 
if you're claustrophobic, it might not be for you. Um, and it's not that easy. It's not as enjoyable to narrate as it is to just read a book for fun, because for the most part, you don't have quite enough or as much say in what you're reading. So that's that's one thing. That's one part of it. Um, also, certain styles of writing are quite difficult to narrate sometimes. Yeah. So some books are written where it's so easy to narrate. Other ones, you will just stumble on all the words <laughs> where they have very long sentences, you know, things like that. It's There's a lot more that goes into it and not to get into all the editing and everything else that goes into it as well. So it's not really something that you can just sit down tomorrow, do it and have a high quality audiobook that'll, you know, sell millions on Audible and things like that. There's a lot more work that goes into it. So when you see something like a per finished hour type thing uh, with a narrator, and I'm saying authors see this, there's more work that you're putting into it beyond just simply reading it and being done then. Yes. Um, so I think that's something that people, most people don't know is for the most part, one finished hour takes about five to eight hours of work. Uh, and that's between prepping the script, the narrator narrating it, and then you send it to the editor to edit and um, all those things. You typically have a proofer as well who will listen um, because sometimes we don't catch our own mistakes. We think we said one word, we said something else, or we mispronounce something thinking that's how it's pronounced. You need another set of ears, just like writers need an editor. <laughs> right. And then you'll do, the, you know, you'll do the edits, it goes back to the audio engineer, and then it gets delivered. So I think that's also an important thing that I think would be helpful if authors knew, because I think also sometimes people have um, really, they want very tight deadlines. They say, oh, you know, it's, it's five hours. Can you have it in two days? I'm like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, if you want the raw audio and I'll just sit down and just, but you're not gonna want that. <laughs> yeah, I, I found out for myself yeah. firsthand, I went into a studio, a local studio to narrate my most recent book, uh, Amazon keywords for books. I, this is the first time I've ever done anything. And, uh, you know, I've had the same experience as what you've heard where some people are like, oh, I've read my books. See, I used to work with senior citizens where I would read books to them. So my thought was, I could be able to do this, no problem. Well, yeah, I would flub up words. The pacing would go off. The the delivery would be off. And so I'd have to stop, let the engineer know, okay, let's roll back, I'll punch back in. And so we were doing that. And a two-hour book, okay, you would think, I would just read it and it'd be done. It took six and a half hours for us to get it all really done for that two hours. So um, do I deserve a banana sticker for getting it done that fast? <laughs> for your first book, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, that's it. in the beginning. That's how it is. But even professional narrators who've been doing this for years or decades, yeah. typically, if you're having a really great day, maybe it'll take you an hour and a half in the booth for an hour. But usually it's closer to two hours maybe two and a half, depends, things like that. And you also need to take breaks, as I'm sure you found out as well. Oh, yeah. After about 20 minutes, especially if, because my, my recording booth is, is a bit small. So after a while, I just, I feel like I need air and things like that. You got to get out of there. And then it adds to the time and everything. Right. Uh, fatigue was my biggest issue. I'm not so much a claustrophobic person. Uh, I, I found I was just getting really, really tired. So this is something that, you know, authors, rights holders, listen to me when I say this, um, you know, per finished hour when you're looking at that and you're going, well, that's really expensive. I want you to think about all the time that they're putting in behind the scenes that requires so much work. Uh, so speaking of authors and right holders, uh, what is something authors and rights holders should know about narrators? Um, well, one of the things that I've already mentioned is the fact that it's typically a team that's going to be working on your, your audiobook. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, another thing is with the scheduling. Uh, so check with the narrator and ask, um, you know, give them the word count and the genre, because that also will affect how long the book is going to be. Um, and then talk to them about their a realistic schedule. And you might want to give them one or two, you know, day, like a few days just in case, because things, things come up sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's important. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you also want the narrator to be very happy to work with you and to, you know, build rapport with them because, um, if if they enjoy working with you then you just you know they might have like a slightly different mood when they think about the project and things like that and obviously we're professionals you don't try to let that affect your work but you always want someone to be you know very happy to begin another project and to collaborate with you 
So it's, I think it's important to to keep that in mind as well. Awesome. We were, we're all in it together at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got to try to put together an awesome project and it's good to be collaborative with those, uh, the, the people that are going to be working with us. Uh, so we were talking briefly about finished price per hour. Could you explain what finished price per hour is and what do you think is a reasonable rate to pay for an experienced narrator? Because there's going to be some people that may have not hired a narrator before. So a ballpark range, obviously. So finished price per hour is um, the amount you will pay per one finished audio hour. So if your book is 10 audio hours, then you're going to pay that price times 10. Um, and as we were mentioning before, because typically when you're hiring a professional, you're actually hiring a team, even though you you interface with the narrator for the most part. Yeah. Um, that's why union rates in the U.S. are set at about 225 in the range of they started around 200 to 250 and then depending on the narrator okay. it might it might vary so that's usually what goes into it yeah and for for new authors that are starting out through acx you actually have additional options as well so if you don't have um you know a big enough budget say you do have a 10-hour book maybe you you want to try it already out with maybe a shorter book to begin um just to give it a go and see, you know, because obviously there's different type of marketing or additional marketing and just see if you're happy with the results you're going to get. But also there's something called um, RS Plus. So that's Royalty Share Plus as well as Royalty Share. So Royalty Share Plus, you will pay um, uh, a small, a smaller stipend per hour. So instead of 250 maybe you'll pay 100 or 75 That's going to vary on, on the narrator. And basically what that means is that um, after that point, you're going to split the royalties with the narrator. Um, I think it's 2020, right? Uh, you get, I think it's, it's 50, 50 of what, um, audible gives you. Correct. Yeah. And then there's also just straight, uh, royalty share where you don't pay anything up front and then you split everything with the narrator. So if you don't have a big budget, then you might want to consider one of those two. But the thing to keep in mind with royalty share and royalty share plus is you're going to have to. Prove to the narrator that um, you are going to invest in marketing and that they're, they can expect that they'll make a decent um, per finished hour rate back on the book over the next couple of months. Because you can't expect, you know, a narrator to pay their team or even if they end up doing the editing themselves or something like that to take those hours away from mm -hmm. earning a living because we have to live too. Um, what? <laughs> just on a book. On, yeah, <laughs> Um, on a book that, you know, you don't promote, nothing happens with it. And then, yeah. So that's the thing to keep in mind. If you want to do a royalty share project, you should be prepared to show them your marketing plans and everything like that. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to invest a ton in AdWords or other things because there are free ways of marketing as yeah. Dale has probably got over. Yeah. But just be prepared with that because you need to sell your project to them. So those are the, yeah. But obviously the benefit is, if you do per finished hour, you keep all of the royalties. Wonderful. From the sales of the books. Yeah. Awesome. Great breakdown, by the way. I almost feel like I can probably just clip that segment out there. You, you explained it very good. All right. So let's share our story. This this is a crazy story. So Ida probably will share her part of the story here in just a moment. I uh, It was about a month ago, right? Uh, we uh, I got a notification. Now, see, I hired Ida through ACX originally. And I kept it all just pretty much a paid or per finished hour. We got the project put up. And after it was done with its exclusivity agreement, you can actually opt your books out of exclusivity after one year of being on ACX. That, that way you can take it over to other platforms. And I wanted to take it over Find Away Voices to share over on the YouTube channel. So I put it on over there. No issues. I just deselected Audible and Amazon through Find Away Voices. So that way there was no crossover there. There shouldn't have been an issue. So I get this email and it's it's pretty it's pretty scary. It's one of those ones where you kind of feel like your the pit of your stomach drop and essentially what it came down to is this email said we have detected or Amazon Audible has detected TTS otherwise known as text to speech with these specific files. Now, mind you, Ida and I have pretty much just communicated only through the ACX platform through messages. We hadn't even connected anywhere else off there because what was there there was no reason to. In any event, I'm thinking text to speech. How is this possible? They're saying essentially this is a computer. So 
I had an experience where I heard some artificial intelligence in the text-to-speech sounding really, really good. So it got me questioning, and I put on my headphones, I turn up the volume as loud as it possibly could go so I could hear everything Ida is saying, and I'm like, I couldn't hear any breaths. Her pacing's perfect. Every time she pronounces a word, it, maybe this is text-to-speech. And so I send back a very panicked note to find away voices and say, I do, I, what's going on here? What happened? This shouldn't have gone to Audible. First of all, strike against you guys. And I'm like, second of all, how, what? And, and of course, they're blown away too because they're going, we can't find anything wrong with this. Well, thankfully, I'd reached out to Will Degas, the, find of, uh, the head of Findaway Voices. He came on in, decided to go ahead, let's, let's expedite this, let's figure this out. And lo and behold... Ida, by the way, is 100% a human being. <laughs> she uh, does not sound anywhere like a robot. Uh, and I hope that. <laughs> we'd found out there was another book that was copycatting ours as far as the title goes. And they had used text-to-speech in their opening credits. And we were, unfortunately, the wrong account. We just, it was a false positive. They're like, whoops, sorry. It's not you guys. It's somebody else. And... So they at least got that problem fixed. Uh, so yeah, I was freaking out. My wife and I spend minutes, you know, probably even an hour or so looking up Ida Maria Boyce and we're trying to find, she's a classically trained violinist. I was like, mm, this is very interesting. I hope we're not being catfished. So on your end of things, um, how, what did it look like on your side? So first of all, I was very surprised because the project had been completed maybe I think almost two years ago, something like that. About a year so it's been a while. So I thought, why would there be any issues now? Um, and then after that, uh, once I realized, you know, TTS was text to speech, I was a bit, oh, sorry. I was a bit offended <laughs> initially. I was thinking, I you should be like a robot. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I started to panic because I thought, okay, it's, it's actually my real voice. If they're flagging my real voice, me actually sitting down and spending the time to narrate it as a robot, and I'm getting kicked off the, pl the platform, that's bad. So I also started to panic, thinking, oh my God, do I need to change my voice? Is there something in the editing? Like, what, what's wrong? So I was also panicking, you know, wanting to find out what happened. But why was the project that's already been on sale for, for two years versus something that's going through QA? So yeah, w when I also read the emails, you know, where they, they said, oh, it was a, you know, it was a glitch. I thought, oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really scared me because I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, to be clear, folks. <laughs> I can't really change my voice, can I? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is you know, there's no, you don't want to purposely go in and create errors in your work so you sound more human. Um, you know, to me, I think you sound perfect. Your delivery is great. And that's what it got me questioning where I was like, oh my gosh, have they really progressed artificial intelligence this much that TTS sounds this good? Uh, so, and by the way, folks, um, I had a point downwards here. Uh, that is where you can find audiobook-narrator.com. I'm sure you have some samples on there or some, some contact information people can go check out. You can also look at her in the ACX platform. Look up Ida Maria Boyson. Her name's right above her head there. And uh, you'll, you'll find, yeah, it, listen to it and you're going to go, oh my gosh, wow, she really is that good. So, uh, all right, so we got to the story. We got to share a little bit of that. I want to go over to the live viewers, but before we do that, how can viewers get in touch with you? So through my website would probably... Kelly, could you do me a favor and double check the uh, video? I think the screen might have frozen. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, now I hear I, you. I froze for a couple seconds there. I hear yeah. you. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing you. Hopefully you're catching up. Uh, yeah, so it, it froze. I didn't hear anything for the past uh, minute or two. Okay. Um, are you hearing me now? I can hear you now. Okay, fantastic. You're still frozen, but that's okay, at least as long as we can hear you. Um, all right, so Rusty Knox asks, do you have a home studio and what equipment do you use? Uh oh. So I do have a, I do have a home studio. Um, okay. I built it in a closet. <laughs> um, yeah. And I used, um, um, oh, what are they called? The, the blankets from, 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> they're sound absorbing blankets. So they're specifically okay. for um, narrators to soundproof your space. Okay. Um, and I have a. Um, uh, I have the AT twenty twenty microphone that I use. AT twenty twenty microphone. Uh, what's the brand on that? Audio Technica. Audio Technica. I, I always hear really good things about them. Have you tried out any other uh, uh, microphones outside of those? Um, not in my home studio. Gotcha. But that's next on my list. Yeah, I want to explore some some different ones. What's your what's your what's on your wish list then? Uh, I'd like to upgrade my microphone because <laughs> I've been using this one for a while. Um, yeah. And at the when I started out, it was what I could afford. So now I'd like to to upgrade my my microphone. But I want to I can't say which one I want because I want to try them out and see which one is the best fit for my mm, voice. Gotcha. So you because everybody wanna... has the you know it's like yeah there is yeah. no one microphone that's amazing for every single voice on the planet. You also you had you have ones that are tend to be favorites. Um, but I do want to find one that's um, a good fit for me specifically. So I'm going to try some out and see how that goes. And especially in my, in my space as well, because I think that also makes a difference nice. in your environment. Hmm. Uh, Rusty Knox further asks, um, I would love to do narration, but I have a horrible nasally Southern accent. Do you do any voice training? Oh, Ida, you might be getting uh, some new coaching clients. <laughs> um, so I do warm ups to warm up my voice. Um, and there are, if you, if you Google voice training exercises on YouTube, you'll come across quite a lot of stuff. So you can try some stuff out and see if that, um, makes any difference. And there's also a lot of videos that talk about, um, tongue placement and things like that, how to keep your head, um, to deal with, um, certain sounds and also microphone placement makes a really big difference. So you might want to try moving it around in your booth. Uh, typically it's recommended to keep it about. Um, Canadian, so I'll say 30 centimeters away from your face what, in inches. How much? I'm not sure I, about like this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really bad about the metric system. So we'll, we'll have everybody Google that up. So 30 centimeters. Yeah. So that's, that's about like, <laughs> so you want to, you want to move them around and see, make sure you have a pop filter mm -hmm. and things like that. And I tend to find uh don't keep your head up like that. You want to have it a little bit lower. Yeah, and also a bit to the side. You do not want to be breathing directly into it. So that might help a bit with um, mm. the nasally sound. It might actually just be you breathing directly into the microphone. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, excellent. So it's not a good idea for me to put it up on my face like this. <laughs> That's a perfect example. <laughs> Um, all right, now, uh, some more questions. This is great, fantastic, folks. Keep them kind of rolling here. We've only got so much time left here with Ida, so if you've got questions for her, please drop it on in here. John Fitch asks, when is it better to use a female voice as opposed to a male voice in terms of the type of book? Mine are in the romance category. I think that's going to depend on probably the main voice of the story. So if you have a romance book and the main character is female, then it might be better to use a female character. Um, but my advice would be listen to a bunch of different audiobooks because you'll have ones with dual narration. You'll have one where it's just the same narrator, where it's a female narrator or a male narrator. And um, just listen to what's out there and then try to make an educated guess based on your research of what would suit your book the best. So I don't think there's one perfect answer. And also your fan base. If you can kind of figure out what their preferences would be, if you can figure out some other authors that they like and look at their audiobooks and see how they produce them, then that would probably be a big help. Excellent. Great tips. Thank you so much. Rusty wants to know, do you ever accept royalty share gigs or is it strictly per finished hour for you? I've done a few royalty shares, mm -hmm. um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, I would need to see what the marketing plans are for them because it's going to be a financial investment on my end. So I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we're both going to end up happy uh, a few months down the line. So that would be my, my stipulation for, for royalty share. I do tend to do mostly per finished hour. I would say that's like 95% of what I do. Yeah. But um, I would make an exception for a royalty share project if, um, you know, we could discuss um, what your plans are for the marketing and things like that um, beforehand. Right on. 
Richard Smith asked, uh, can we hear a sample of her narration? And uh, do you have samples over on your website? I do, I do. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rather than trying to pull it up here, folks, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to dial in those type of things here on the live broadcast, and I don't want it to sound trashy because OBS messes up and such. So it's better that you hear it directly. Put your headphones on. Go to her website at audiobook-narrator.com. By the way, great score on that domain name. I mean, wow. Yeah, I was really shocked. And if you actually just type in audiobooknarrator.com, the website isn't working. <laughs> Because that was the first one I tried to get. Yeah. I was really surprised. Uh, let's see. I've got a few other questions <laughs> I was here. very happy to get it. Uh, some people said, sure, SM7B is a great mic. Okay, awesome. Awesome, thanks. She's narrating now, literally. Yes. Yes, now you guys can't see her, but we can definitely hear her loud and clear. So, um, Oh, is my camera still Yeah, frozen? the camera was off, um, but I just went ahead and rolled with it. Uh, let's okay, see Okay, I here. turned it back. I, I turned it back on. But it'll work. I'm not sure if it's pulling up yet. No, it's okay. We're 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 gonna keep going, and now everybody knows. Like this, this is how you deliver. And by the way, you know, it's not like she's inside her audio booth, so don't consider this the same quality she's gonna deliver to you folks here. Book Award Pro. No, I'm in my living room. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, uh, Book Award Pro Hannah um, is asking this a question: How do you figure out which microphone works best for you? Ooh. You gotta try them out and also speak okay. to people, uh, speak to the professionals when you go into a store or you can call an online store and ask them about it, but you're gonna have to try it out at home to see. Because even if you explain, you know, my voice is higher or lower, or deeper, things like that, they can guide you in the right direction, but ultimately you're gonna have to hear it. You're gonna have to hear how it, how it sounds. Mm, okay. Ray R. Wise asks, do you use WAV files or MP3s? So I tend, the finished products, uh, or sorry, the final audio files are always to ACX standard. So they have to be mono MP3s with um, uh, fixed bit rate 192. <laughs> gotcha. So uh, that's what the, that's what's going to be delivered to the, the authors. Gotcha. Excellent. Uh, someone actually had, uh, uh, corrected us uh, or set us straight on this. 30 centimeters is 11 inches, so just about roughly one foot. So, all right, good, good to know. So you got to keep that microphone. <laughs> I typically have whenever I'm doing these live broadcasts. There's about a foot and a half between my my mouth and that, so that way it's not up on top of me. Uh, John Fitch says, "How would I arrange to have a male and a female narrator collaborate? I have a book that is in two voices, his and hers." And would it be ideal if I could have a male and a female narrate it together? Um, so typically narrators will have um, another narrator that they will work with if they do dual narration. So if you are posting the um, audition on ACX, you want to write that in the notes and say you're looking for dual narration and then request um, that they the audio that they submit, the audition, uh, maybe has like a minute of the female and a minute of the male. Yeah. Um, so typically you will not be the one to find the individuals. Typically they'll know each other and so work as a team already. Mm. And if they do it often, they'll probably have other books that you can, you know, listen to a sample of to hear. Do you do much collaborations at all, Ida? Um, I've done, I've done a few, not that often, but, but I have done some in the past. Nice. Yeah. And I have to say, I, I think the finished product sounds a bit better when when it's dual, if it's a lot of back and forth narration or like they switch the point of view in romance books, I think the final product um, is is a more enjoyable listen for the, the listener. <laughs> awesome, good insights, I'm loving this. Uh, great seeing everybody kind of uh, chiming in here. Uh, Michael Heister said, uh, you don't have to spend a zillion dollars on a mic. Uh, he's got an Amazon Basics and it sounds pretty darn good. Very cool, man. Uh, New Joyful Sounds asks this, my new book is 225 pages. How much can I ex ex expect to spend for an audio narrator? So you're gonna have to um, look at the word count and then estimate it based on the word count um, because pages, it, it's hard to estimate. I don't know how big the font, I don't know what type of font it is, how big it is, the spacing and things like that. Um, but, um, Typically for my books, uh, I tend to narrate about 8,500 words to about 9,200 words per finished hour. 
depending on the genre. So you can, ACX will say 9,300 words per finished hour, but I find that that's a bit too fast. So maybe if you use about 9,000, you can estimate. So take the total word counts and divide it by 9,000, and it'll give you a rough estimation of how, how long the audiobook will be. Excellent. Thank you for those insights. That's awesome. Uh, someone actually answered. <laughs> Michael said, depends on the narrator. So that's that's really good. Okay, so Lokish Parashar says this. Let me share my pain. Impressions on Amazon ad campaign is almost 50,000. Okay, we're probably not going to talk about Amazon ads right now, buddy. Um, we're going to be focused more on narration today. Um, I'll be happy to talk about that in future broadcasts. My apologies. Uh, Billy Zig said, would you use a country-specific narrator or could I still use an American narrator for my Australian-based book? That's going to be your call. If you think your audience will respond well, then of course. Um, uh, the thing is, a lot of narrators do also do accents. So there are a lot of um, American narrators who do great British accents or Australian accents. And same from Australia, do amazing American accents. I would say maybe pay more attention to how you feel when you listen to their to their uh, audition. If you feel like you're able to get into the story and they connect well with it, maybe base it off of that. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. A lot insights. of these answers are, it depends. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's so tough to kind of say, and, and you know, and I, I don't blame you. I, there's nothing I can really add anything else to this. Uh, let's go ahead and start to wrap things up. Thank you very much, Ida. I really do appreciate you uh, taking a little bit of time out your day to share a little bit of wisdom here with us. Again, how can people get a hold of you? At my website, audiobook-narrator.com. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Or if you search you. for my name on a